Back to neuroscience. Now, neuroscience looks, so this is the kind of real hard science behind leadership. It looks at how our brains work. And um, drawing isn't my strength. <laughs> this is actually your brain, not a kidney. Okay, so, um, but I just can't do it very well. So, whenever, first of all, change is absolutely critical. A leader's job, according to John Cotter, who's a very serious Harvard Business Review guy, is to change people's behavior. And with all of you, you are offering people an opportunity to grow and develop, to change their behavior. The ones that sit and go, oh, no, I could never do that. No, I could never stand up in front of a group, even six people. I oh, know, I don't have enough friends. No, no, I couldn't do that. You know, our job is to help them feel more confident to change their behaviors. Well, this is how we do it, through change. But the trouble is, of course, change makes everybody think of the F word, which, of course, is fear, okay? <laughs> and this truly is the big F word, and, and I know you've had a session on it, and we're going to say just a couple of things on this, because fear busting is absolutely critical. But we'll come back to that, okay? So I'll show you why change makes people fearful. So, when you learn something new, the prefrontal cortex starts to work. And the brain loves to learn. If you want to stay young and alive and vital until you're old, really, really old, then you've got to keep learning. And you have to learn new stuff. It doesn't, look, if you can play a musical instrument, don't go learn to play another one. If you can speak a language, no learning another language. If you're a brain surgeon, don't become a kidney surgeon. You know, like, because if you can play music, the music lump in your brain is already big. What you want to do is get other lumps in your brain, like a language lump, and a dancing lump, and um, a knitting lump. It doesn't matter what it is, you want to get new lumps in your brain. So, when I turned, I'm 56 now, when I turned about 53, that was when my mum died, and she left me some money, and I had always wanted to play the harp. Well, I bought myself a harp, and we were living in Vermont. Any Vermonters here? Oh, hello, three of you. Mm. <laughs> Growth opportunity coming along. Mm -hmm. I'm heading there tomorrow. I'll see what I can do for you. I'll sign up a couple of people. Anyway, so um, I found this amazing woman who teaches the harp in Vermont. She's a saint, I tell you, she's a saint, because she took me on. I can't even read music. I, you know, to me, there are little dots on pages. And, and I knew F-A-C-E and every good boy deserves fruit, but that's all I knew. And you know, learning the harp is no easy thing. Because mm -mm -mm. you've got this thing that sits against you and there are all these strings. And the only reason I knew what the strings were is because they were color coded, you know, it's like red was C and blue was F. And, and what you, you can't look at them because you have to go like this. And so your hands are magically supposed to come away from your sides and land on the exact right note. <laughs> Not. And, um, and then how you hold your hands is really important because otherwise it makes a horrible noise versus a gorgeous harp noise. And then, you know, you're supposed to read music at the same time. Well, I would finish an hour's lesson and I would walk away going, <gasps> oh, gee, and have to lie down for an hour because whenever you do something new, the prefrontal cortex kicks in. It's really working hard and it sucks up a lot of oxygen. And that's what makes you tired, but it's good. It's really good for your brain. Now, here's the other thing. Once you've done the new activities often enough, once you've repeated them enough, they get stored back here in the basal ganglia. And remember when you first learned to drive a car? Do you remember how white your parent was <laughs> as you're driving? See, the first time you go to drive a car, your feet are doing something, your hands are doing something, and, and your, this other hand's got to do something else, and then you've got to look at the road and see cars. So you're like driving along going, what, what cars, what cars, help, help. And that's your prefrontal cortex. And your parents are going, look out, look out, look out, turn, 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 press, press, press. Now, once you had, once they of course had had their heart attack and recovered, and, and you had done it often enough, it became automatic. Now 
Oh, you can drive, play the music, do your text, you know, which is not a good thing to do, and lipstick, everything. In fact, how many times have you driven home and you actually didn't remember getting there? Mm -hmm. ah. And you hadn't had alcohol, okay, this is without alcohol. And, and that's because your good old basal ganglia took over. Now, the other thing is, have you ever heard of the amygdala? Now, the amygdala is a little teeny-weeny thing here, just near the prefrontal cortex. And when, when the prefrontal cortex starts to work a lot, if you're really having a hard time, the amygdala gets affected. And the amygdala is the oldest part of the brain. It's part of the limbic system. It's called the reptilian brain sometimes. And its job is your survival. It wants you to survive. It doesn't give a rat's ass about your success. It's interested in your survival. And so, what, anything that's a bit new and different, the amygdala goes, oh, no, 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 no. That will mean we have to be different. Things won't be the same. And then what will happen? We'll die. We're gonna die. Oh, no, if you learn to do something new. Oh, no, no, no. So see, the amygdala kicks in, and it thinks it's trying to help you survive, but it's really holding you back. So, I got this great phrase for you, okay? We're gonna call it Ami. So this is your Ami. And the next time you go do something new and you suddenly become aware of Ami inside you going, no, no, don't do this. No, don't stand up in front of the people. Your pants will fall down. No, you'll look an idiot. You'll never make director. You're not good enough. No, don't do this. You gotta think. Now, my Emmy is interested in my survival, and it really thinks it's trying to help. So you have to say, thank you, Emmy, but not now. So, on the count of three, we're going to embed this in our bodies. I want you to turn to your new best friend on one side, and then the other, and I want you to say, wait till I count to three, okay? Otherwise, you'll go nuts. So wait, wait. And you're going to say, thank you, Emmy, but not now. Thank you, Amy, and because we've got so many people in the one team here, if you hear one of your team members saying something that you think's an Amy statement, I want you to help them say, hmm, I wonder if that's an Amy statement. Hmm, <laughs> okay? So, ready? On the count of three. Thank you, Amy, but not now. One, two, three, go. Thank you, Amy, but not now. Thank you, Amy, but not now. Beautiful, beautiful. So, so, but wait, wait. There's another formula for change, okay? Now this, honestly, this is scientific. The formula for change is to fuck, and it is spelled F-A-R-C, okay? Keep breathing, F-A-R-C. Now, let me share with you what it's for. So, the F stands for focus. If you want to change things in your life, you have to focus on what it is that you want to change to. Because some of you are still going, oh, I can't believe she said that. It's like, it's fuck, it's all right, it's a normal word. So, focus. We create what we focus on. If you guys want to focus on all the negative things that happen to you, what happens? More negative. Do you know, we, the reason I did this thing the, going from here to here. Have you ever seen a toddler stand like this? No, toddlers don't stand like this because it feels horrible. Toddlers stand like this, but they see us doing it. And because they want to be just like us, after a while a toddler goes, oh well, I think I'll stand like this. <laughs> and they think they look cool because this is just like mommy and daddy. And it feels awful, but they persist until one day they rewire their brains to make this feel comfortable, even though it's not. And that's what we do all the time. We are hardwired for fear. We're not as toddlers, but we learn this along the way. So we get to our ages and we're hardwired for fear. So we've got to control Emmy and we have to start to focus on the good things. Be a good finder. And you know, the other day, I was writing this down, I was saying, um, in my notes, I was saying we have to be a good finder. And that's what I wrote. And I thought, hmm, there's a message there. Just thought I'd share that with you. <laughs> anyway, back to focusing. What is it that you're gonna focus on? 
No, serious, that's a true story. And I'm not pushing it down anybody's throat. I don't mind what you believe in. But really, I thought that, mm, that's interesting. Anyway, so focus on the best things in life and focus on how you want to feel. So if you imagine, you spend every morning, spend a couple of minutes imagining how you will feel when you have got to the place in your life that you would next like to be. If you want to be a superstar, flashy, sparkly, on top, whirly gig director, then feel what it would be like to have 600 people in your downline. 600 people who are all directors, who are all learning to be fabulous leaders using the three qualities that we're talking about now. So the A, the actual research says A is for attention, but I think it's better to make it about awareness. You know, we have to be aware of the whole. Buckminster Fuller said the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And that means you. When you see Sensi, it is a whole that is greater than the sum of the energy of each individual person in this room. Th that's another reason you're so successful. You're focusing on the whole. All of your teams are trying to make the best of every person within them. And that's, I mean, it's awesome. It's just awesome, you guys. So stay aware of the whole, because each of us is a hologram of the whole, meaning you pay attention to everybody else and you all try to help each other succeed and grow. And as you do that, you make ex exponential growth. So the R is for repetition doing whatever it is again and again and again until it gets rewired. So you know you're gonna have to catch yourself because you'll go back to standing like this and every so often have a little foot check, look down and go, oh, there I go again. Straighten them up and then they'll slide out and you get them back. And once you've repeated it enough over a period of time, this feels normal and this is the one you're gonna love. What do you think this stands for? Celebration, yeah. And that's, oh, celebration. Now, this is the really good thing about the brain. It loves celebration. And, and, wait, you hear this, you're gonna love this one. Um, do you know, with, with all this new science that they've got now, they are proving that when people are happy, so remember, I think happiness is just one little piece of joy. To me, let's replace that joyful. When people are joyful first, then productivity, performance, innovation, and creativity are all improved and stress is less. So do you know what that means? It means party first, then work. Is that great? It's joy first, then the work comes. Joy first, then success.